is Lyubov Akulenko. I represent uh, the Ukrainian Center for European Policy, and today we would like to present to our studies that we've been working on for a few months. And one of them is about the integration integration to internal market under the conditions of war, and second is monitoring of performing the association agreement. Before the beginning of our presentation, I would like to add from my side just a few words that all our speakers who are going to join, they will be online because like COVID made its amendments and people are used to communicating online and not in person. I don't want to be banal and talk about how important it is, I mean, uh, this historical uh, decision and our status that we received last year. What is happening right now in the field of integration in our team, we call it the so-called revolution, revolutionary development and not evolution development. And this kind of development has its own advantages and disadvantages. From one side, it provides us with a lot of opportunities. And from the other side, we can ask ourselves what our capabilities are. And um, policy usually gives us some historical chances. And we experts are looking for solutions. With these two studies, we were considering the brief horizon and namely the moment before the beginning of the negotiations, what can be done by Ukraine already now in order not just to ask for money because it's the simplest thing to do, but what we can do using the association agreement in order to survive under the conditions of war. So this is the task that we set for ourselves and we decide to analyze that. Why did we do the monitoring of the agreement, our independent monitoring? Because for us, it's an opportunity to prognose how long the negotiations will last because having the analysis for the whole pe period of performing the agreement, we understand it's just one third and we can understand how much we can do in the future or maybe something will change and we will adapt that really quickly so right now we are going to present our first work which is uh, called ukraine on its path to the eu internal market in work conditions before giving the floor to my colleague the study will be presented by alexandra blana she is next, sitting next to me. She is our analyst. I will just make a brief spoiler in order for the study to be remembered. And maybe Alexandra will have some other things she will um, she would like to pay attention to. But during our discussions, I just remem remembered a few things. First of all, why we started doing that. Not only because of war, but because of everyone is looking for quick victories for Ukraine, understanding, I guess, uh, that negotiations will last for a long time. And one of the ideas that is there in public space is that a quick victory is an integration of Ukraine to internal EU market. And we decided to work with that. First of all, we realized it's a myth because it can't be. It cannot happen. We cannot uh, just quickly go to internal market of the EU because it's like legislation. We can only talk about some quick victories in certain sectors. The third moment is that in general, the best thing is to integrate to get integrated to the internal market if you are a full member. If you are not a member of the EU, these games can end badly. The fourth conclusion that we came up with is that in certain sectors right now, without being a member of the EU, this integration maybe should not be promoted. This is also related to war. And the last, my personal conclusion, which is not present in our work, is that in negotiations, we should have a separate Euro integrational renovation plan. This is my personal opinion, because that that is what was done by Croatia, and they had the experience before. And I think it will be honest, because we are not in equal conditions if we compare ourselves with Moldova, with the uh, Western Baltic countries. Um, so that's our expert idea that we also realized. So I give the floor to Alexandra, and um, she has more conclusions, which are maybe more interesting than mine. Greetings. Thank you very much, 
Lvov, and if possible, can we see the presentation? Thank you very much. I am presenting from the name of our Ukrainian Center for European Policy, our study on integra Ukraine's integration into the EU internal market and work conditions. When we just started uh, this study, lear having learned the methodology of entering the EU, we realized that this process can be fast. At least the existing members of the EU, the length of their accession was like from 3 to 14 years. So this process is going to take many years. At the same time, because of war, Ukrainian economy already faced a lot of limitations and losses, and integration to the internal market looked like really good option that can be achieved in order to improve the position of Ukrainian trade and economy already right now. Our study covers a few directions, first of which is um, the legislative part. Why did we decide to take this into our work? Because this is where the process of negotiations begin. This is fundamentals clusters, it's part of this, and not only, but our business in the interviews underlines that the rule of law is very important for the development of business. So the request is not only from external, from the EU, that the rule of law has to be improved, but also the request which is internal from Ukrainian business and citizens so that we have to resolve this issue. In addition to that, our study and its biggest part is about the trade, trade with services and goods. That is how we can integrate with the EU in these directions. And if we look at our trade under the conditions of wartime, we see that the main things that changed during the war, that is the break of logistics roads. And due to that and the blockade of ports, we have strong limitations, first of all, um, limitations for trade, and secondly, the roads changed dramatically and the countries where we export our goods to also changed. And uh, the part of EU grows, uh, especially the neighboring countries where we have the uh, border, uh, it's uh, Poland, Bulgaria, Romania and others. Physical limitations in our trade, it was the main problem of 2022, and we were hoping that this year physical limitations maybe will be a bit weaker thanks to the development of the infrastructure and further work of the borders. But as we see here, we also have quite a lot of difficulties, for example, blocking the grain corridor from the side of Russia and also, we have some political restrictions due um, to some issues with our neighboring countries. For Ukraine, it's important uh, to cancel uh, the customs and quotes for the whole period of war. And recently, thanks to the EU, we received the prolongation of it till 2024. But no matter how long the war will last, we are interesting. We are interested so that uh, this period of cancelling the um, customs is very important for us to renew our economy. On this graph, you can see how, how strong the war impacted the trade and how much the part of the EU grows at the time of military actions. And in February, it was a break of tendencies and the part of EU grew dramatically. And now Ukraine is really dependent on the trade with the EU and relationship with EU and cooperation looks as a main priority right now for Ukraine. If we are talking about sectors that we were analyzing, then one of them, one of the most interesting, are technical barriers in trade. Why is it interesting? It's a sector where before war Ukraine, in the framework of the association agreement, has probably the biggest progress we implemented 
approximately 85% of all the requirements and all the obligations provisioned by uh, the association agreement. So here, really big progress was demonstrated even in 2021 in Ukraine. We already had the evaluation mission to evaluate whether Ukraine is ready to start negotiations on um, but the war impacted badly on this sector, and this is related to the fact that the military actions really impacted uh, the industry in Ukraine. And everything related to infrastructure and quality with assessment uh, of whether it sticks to the rules, but it depends strongly on the processing industry and Due to that, the sector has a lot of sufficient problems, and one of important problems in this sector also is the flow of the personnel and reduction of incomes. In addition to that, due to shellings, our enterprises of uh, quality infrastructure, they also had losses, and due to that, in order for us to move forward to the EU, to be integrated in the internal market, we need not only to harmonize our legislation with uh, the EU legislation, but also to rebuild the sector itself and to see how our processing industry is going to be developed. And we have to take into account their needs. And till the end of the war, we need it will be really difficult to assess the needs there. First steps in this sector is to speed up harmonization of national standards that are harmonized less than, like for less than 50% with EU standards. It is to implement the regulation of the EU 1020 and as well as strengthen the institutional capacity of uh, uh, the state monitoring bodies and also to implement uh, two technical regulations, one about the packaging, second, interoperability within the railway transport. In order to have the full integration, Ukraine will have to face dozens or even hundreds of technical regulations that will be, that have to be implemented in order to talk about the end of this part. The next sector that we were considering is agriculture. Agriculture and development of uh, the agricultural territories, this direction has always been important because Ukraine is a really powerful agrarian country, but under the conditions of law and logistics and the losses that we had, the part of agriculture products and the structure of our export came to 50%, and it is a critically important sector for us. At the same time, we are facing still certain problems in this sector that are related to transport infrastructure and logistics. And of course, the first thing that is needed for the development in this sector is development of infrastructure on the territory of neighboring EU countries with the aim to increase capacity for transporting and preserving agriculture products. As we can see that with the conflict with the neighboring countries, lack of capacity is one of the reasons why these conflicts emerge in general. In addition to that, Ukraine really needs some advocacy campaign that will position Ukraine as a partner, European partner, and will explain that we already have chosen the path of movement towards EU. We are going to be there. We will be part of internal market. Correspondingly, European business has to look for possibilities of cooperation with us and that we will be in the air market and they don't need to try to ban our products. Uh, as for the direction of sanitary and phytosanitary, issues we need to join the crisis system in order to move on forward and increase selling our agriculture products transport this sphere became the biggest challenge during the war 
Here it covers the main directions, main transport directions, that is uh, road transport, railway transport. We try to cover all the sectors in the field of uh, road transport. Our primary primary task have uh, to uh, be the vehicle transportation for the whole period of war. In this sector in general, before the war, Ukraine did not have a huge progress in the car transport. And here is a lot of problems because the EU has bigger requirements to safety of the transport, but it is it also impacts our business with trans related to transportation, and it can increase the costs of this. And that is why the implementation was long and, and durable in time. Actually, we don't expect that after the end of war, somebody will prolong the agreement on uh, road transportations if we do not achieve the requirements that the EU has. As uh, for the primary task, is uh, it's interoperability of uh, the moving stock. That is, railway development is on the first place right now. And also before the war, according to the obligations that were according to what was required from Ukraine, we did not have sufficient progress and we will have to do that. But the primary thing is to ensure a availability of infrastructure and development, the possibility to improve and speed up railway transportation with the EU countries. As for the marine transport, actually we, as we are the participants of a lot of uh, different conventions, there's not a lot of things that haven't been implemented or the things that we have to do, but save marine roads after the end of war and um, demining uh, the equatorium of the Black Sea. That is one of the main tasks. As for the internal water transport in Ukraine, we are interested that uh, the Ukrainian part of the Danube River has to be in included to the European network. It's a doubtful issue, actually, because here we have a lot of different aspects why it can be difficult, but under the conditions of the blockade of marine ports, like the ports of the ports of the Danube, are those that ensure transportation of our products. One more sector we've been working with. This is the sector of e-commerce and postal services. And here, this sector, I would like to say, a spoiler. You know, it is really a dependent on transport. European Union is our nearest by territory and the biggest market where Ukrainian products are supplied to via e-commerce. And due to war, Ukrainian enterprises became less competitive. But as for the e-commerce, there are two main factors that are impacting most. This is a possibility to accept payments, and Ukrainian business should have no problems with that. And second, quick and reliable logistics. Taking into account the queues on the borders and when it's impossible to use aviation transport, it's impossible to use marine transport. So it's critically important in order to preserve certain e-commerce for Ukraine right now. It's to go through with the railway transport, with the road vehicles to pass the uh, borders. We have to cooperate with express transportations and simplify the custom speed up those procedures. But um, at the same time, it might be not enough. Because as uh, for the biggest uh, point uh, with the pollen, it takes long time in order to pass it. So we have to have like negotiations with European partners in order to simplify the um, 
duties to open the new points for passing the border this is what is critically needed in addition to that in these sectors even in spite of them being really perspective for Ukraine, we can see that implementation of the EU aquas is not that intense. And in the postal services sector, only last year we adopted the basic law, and still there are some questions to that it needs to be processed further on. Here we will have a lot of work related to implementation of the legislation. And the last sector we've been working with is the sector of digital services or um, telecommunication. It's a very interesting sector because in spite of war, Ukraine continues to demonstrate progress in this field and um, is achieving progress uh, in many directions. But just like in many other sectors, we face the fact that Ukraine has losses due to damages of the infrastructure due to the military actions and rebuilding of this infrastructure is our primary task in this sector. At the same time, we have to understand uh, that uh, renovation of infrastructure will cost us more than the losses from already existing infrastructure because it's a sector that is developed quickly and we need to rebuild the infrastructure with the use of uh, modern technologies and on the higher level than it used to be before. One of the problem directions in this field is the cybersecurity direction and before where it was not developed really well. And with this direction, we have to implement still a lot of uh, EU aquas. And in addition to that, we need to develop you know, our business in the field of cybersecurity. We need to encourage our businesses to improve, to actually put some money into that development and to encourage our businesses to develop in this sector because this is the direction. Like if we just join the EU, we can face the fact that then our services in the field of cybersecurity won't develop as far as we are lacking behind really in this direction. In addition to that, in the field of uh, telecommunication for Ukraine, it's very important to develop the broadband access to the internet with a speed not less than uh, 100, 100 megabits per second. But again, it requires the updating uh, updating the infrastructure and it will need at least a few years. In addition to that, um, as uh, for the services, Ukraine demonstrates the progress in this field. And uh, Ukraine also adopted the law when uh, Ukraine starts recognizing the digital signatures from the EU. It's very positive because this also simplifies trade, simplifies signing agreements between Ukrainian and European counter agents. But in order to have full integration, uh, and in order to have the MRA agreement and sign it, we need to implement Aquis, EU Aquis, and also to create uh, the system of monitoring of digital services. Actually, I covered all the services that we were analyzing in our study. I would like to mention that, actually, like summing up, Ukraine faced the fact that in certain sectors we before implementing the legislation and before moving forward at first we need to rebuild the things that were damaged and that were lost and it's a huge challenge that we will face later on and it will slow down our progress to the EU and our integration to the internal market. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for your presentation. And uh, you can learn more details about this study on our website after the end of our event. We will publish that. Now I would like uh, to invite Marki Jan um, Metrasevich, Deputy Minister of Agrarian Policy and Food of Ukraine uh, in the field of European integration. Uh, 
It happens so that agrarian field from one side is a field that can give us opportunity to earn money and from the other side, it, as we are talking in our team, agrarian field demonstrated that who are going to be our most problematic countries who will stand on our way when negotiating uh, about the entrance, about the accession to EU. Maybe you can tell us what the ministry is doing right now in order to survive under the conditions of war. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lubov. Thank you for the invitation. Hello to everyone. It is obvious that negotiations about the agrarian um, part will be, in our opinion, the most difficult in the process of our entrance to the European Union. We already saw that in practice with the recent events that are happening with our neighboring countries. Nevertheless, right now, already, we are trying to conduct negotiations with the neighboring countries, uh, with the uh, Bulgaria, but also in the framework of negotiations with the European Commission, as it is provisioned for by the association agreement and legislation of the European Union. And it is clear that Ukraine as a big agrarian country with a reputation of a big agrarian country and big exporter in the eyes of our neighboring farmers who are working in the European Union are considered to some extent as a threat, but nevertheless, European Union had already experience of uh, such countries as Romania, Hungary, and Poland that um, entered EU and nothing critical happened. Everything became normal and the usual trade continued. Nevertheless, we need to understand that the reason of such, let us say so, of such being careful from the side of European farmers, it's the war. And actually, it's the fact that you mentioned in your study, this is the break of the logistics chain. Because even before war, we were exporting a lot to the EU we were exporting agrarian products. Mainly the export was via our marine ports. And therefore, for example, Polish farmer haven't seen uh, the vehicles with the Ukrainian grain in front of their house, so to say, on the road. And it was simpler for them. They simply did not feel that under the conditions of what was happening during the previous year on the agrarian markets, again, after the beginning of the full-scale invasion, the growth of price, then stabilization of price, which actually remained on the high level at the beginning of 2023, after the reports and prognosis result, uh, uh, this price went down on all the world markets, and it was felt by Polish farmers as well. But as far as Polish farmers, they see the vehicles with the Ukrainian grain on their roads. Unfortunately, this situation happened when psychologically this factor worked. And in addition to that, also we have the elections in Poland in autumn. So that is why we have this situation, but we are cooperating with the European Commission in order to show with numbers, not with the psychology or emotions, to show with numbers that nothing extraordinary happened. And actually, to a great extent, our neighboring countries, neighboring EU countries, just won even from this cooperation, especially the air processing industry. And Poland, who exported actually the record number and um, also amount of agrarian products, the processing products. And in addition to that, the Hungary directly confirms that Ukrainian corn, under the conditions of um, last year, it just saved their agrarian industry. So under the framework of your study, we are doing and we are trying to mention that we are partners who traditionally exported a lot to the European market. 
And it is clear that under the conditions of war and under the conditions of um, blockade of our marine ports, this export achieved its peak. Nevertheless, it was a winning situation also for the agrarian sector of our neighboring countries. Therefore, one more time, I indeed agree with the thesis that was mentioned in the study about the positioning of Ukraine as a partner in agrarian field. Now, as for the implementation of legislation, you know that in spite of war, in spite of the difficulties that we faced during the year of war. Indeed, we made some progress under our association agreement obligations, and now we are going beyond uh, only the agreement, association agreement, which is actually one third of European ex equus. Now we are making screening in order to understand the whole amount of legislation of the European Union which we will need to implement or harmonize with also in agrarian field. Now we are switching to developing institutional mechanisms that are necessary in order to implement the common agricultural policy of the European Union as uh, certain agencies. And this is these are payout agencies, and it was uh, also mentioned in the report for the Commission. We are also uh, making our agrarian policy closer to European agrarian policy. And according to the association agreement, we start working on what was mentioned by you as well, that under the conditions of martial law and uh, the reconstruction after the war, we won't be able to take all the burden of the obligations of, for example, like the Green Deal or implementation of all the standards of the European Union at the same time in one moment. For such things, we will develop and we will offer from the side of Ukraine some transitional periods for the implementation and for some things, for example, the well-being of animals, these things will acquire additional costs from our producers. And in order to do that, we will ask for some support from the European Union, the support for such producers. And based on the self-screening and based on this these associations and agrarian businesses, we will build our future negotiation positions in the procedure of uh, accessing EU. Thank you. I'm ready to answer your questions. Markian, thank you very much for your speech. Um, from 2014, agrarian uh, field was the field that always demonstrated positive results. And I am really happy that you say that the business is ready and business understands all the businesses understand all the challenges and how to position themselves and the European market. And also in our team, we think that probably Ukraine is going to open this issue in European Union that maybe European Union should not just close their eyes uh, on the Polish behavior and how they are violating the whole legislation on trade. And uh, recently, some European countries, uh, they um, were not happy with the conclusion of the European Commission. So I'm happy that in such painful way, we are showing the European countries that uh, they should not always blame us for what is happening. But now I would like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Taras Kachka, Deputy Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Ag Agriculture of Ukraine, and he is also trade representative of Ukraine. Um, we um, know Taras for a long time, and I don't know who better knows the things about negotiation processes. I know that Taras is working on this similar uh, document, the so-called plan of actions for uh, the nearest years in order to 
expand the free trade uh, region. And our logic was to develop some steps um, towards negotiations. I would like to hear about your logic and um, how do you see what can we use right now uh, before the beginning of negotiations in order not um, to suffer in such difficult conditions. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank for your study. Actually, the more uh, studies there are, the better it is. I would like to continue what was mentioned already by Mr. Markian. As of today, the association agreement uh, stopped working in general because the Polish uh, Republic and Hungary and European Commission actually do not pay attention on the availability of that in part of trade because what happened was as of today all the actions uh, on Ukrainian agrarian pro about Ukrainian agrarian products are violating the fundamental provisions of the um, trade legislation and it also makes us doubt about uh, the agreement as such, because we can talk a lot about uh, the internal market regime or application of some rules, but we can see that, generally speaking, Poland, as of today, is just violating somehow, is has really creative attitude and um, of going against the association agreement about the access to the market and also about uh, the interpreting uh, some uh, duty procedures and also sanitary legislation, classification of uh, duty products and so on. So generally speaking, what is happening right now from the middle of April and till today, it's a joint violation of both by European Commission and by uh, member states in terms of association agreements. So the question arises, how is that possible? I mean, how does this legal mechanism work? Because um, to a great extent, what is offered to us are some political agreements. In practice, of course, we are reducing the tension on the border, but the fact remains the fact that all these actions, they are beyond the logics of the association agreement. And in parallel to that, we are talking about some internal markets. We are making discussions of some jurisdiction of uh, uh, European Court of Justice. But we see that um, generally the example that is shown by our friends, because again, the Polish Republic, they are trying to position themselves as a country who is supporting the practical integration of Ukraine to the EU. Uh, they show that these uh, legal instruments, they don't work actually, and they don't work both like legally and from the point of view of policy, because to a great extent, um, we see that there is no reasoning in order to implement uh, these restrictions. And I'm really glad that 14 member states paid attention of, uh, um, to that, and um, uh, they stressed to the European Commission that these are illegal actions. and. Uh, this is the same with our position. Before talking about some positive things, we need to understand whether the association agreement works in general, because today it doesn't. And it also impacts other directions, because we did a lot also with the roaming market and services. We did a lot also in terms of understanding of integration to internal market. The same was done in energy sector. And it is obvious that we will have to resolve that legal problem which is created by the decisions um, of both like national governments and European Commission. We don't have to forget the fact that the limitation or the restriction that was offered by European Commission, it does not correspond to the association agreement at all. That is, uh, this is a pretty obvious loss for all the processes that are happening for us. Now we see the signals about the sanitary and phytosanitary that as of today in the Polish Republic, there is a really like some bad things going on uh, related to Ukrainian products and the procedures that we were implementing for a long time, 
they are used against us in a really not good manner and actually it is obvious that now we have to spend quite a lot of time in order to come back to that normal logics and we have a lot of plans because in addition to roaming in addition to ACA agreement we have a lot of other priorities uh, on public procurement on further integration on in the public procurement and again sanitary and phytosanitary on expanding the cooperation and technical regulations and here also we need to understand what can help us in these spheres what can help us cope with this problem first of all to come back to procedures as soon as possible come back to the normal work under the association agreement and i hope that uh, this understanding from the eu side will come and is coming and secondly we have to stop talking or speaking with the categories of uh, continuing these transition periods even in most difficult fields even in agriculture we need right now to be integrated in the most difficult obligations because it's not only about agriculture we also see the same in the industry that the easiest way of uh, integration to the EU is actually to say that we will do, we will perform certain application in five, ten, or seven years. Unfortunately, this gives space for um, such bad things that we are seeing right now in the agriculture market. So we need to step away from the logic of longer transitional periods and we have to talk about uh, the fast and full integration of ukraine on in all the markets and actually we need to change to go deeper into these aqueous but in addition to self-screening we also have to understand that we have the process under the association agreement about the opportunity of integration in the field of financial services what we saw in the beginning of the year when usually the field of financial services um, in comparison to other services it was not the highest priority but now we see that from the side of european commission uh, they are interested in order to they are interested in establishing the apps and so on so even such procedural things they allow us discuss seriously how we can be integrated right now so the main accent has to be um is like having most serious approach in order to integrate the markets that we can integrate under the association agreement in order not to postpone the problematic things we have to use them positively and i hope that via this uh, discussion and good discussion that we have about like agrarian things we won't come to antagonism or some parallel existence but we will come to integration because understanding is clear at the time when poland is blocking import spain is suffering uh, from some weather problems from some drought and i don't think that um the whole world will suffer from the lack of uh, their like uh, certain food but they will uh, suffer if jamon won't be available and they need our corn to do that and we have to find solution to such um, situations not from the point of view who's guilty and who's not because we see that here Poland is on that side but we have to find the solution that will allow us to develop maximally our agriculture and also Spanish or for example like um, our metal production and also in some other countries so from all the sides from the sides of the studies and from the sides of governmental work we have to pay accent to solving problems here and now and not using long transitional periods thank you thank you very much taras and historically it happened so that we are really unlucky with the neighbors one is really aggressive and the other one doesn't let us trade i would last i would like to reflect on your phrase phrase about the transitional periods 
uh, I personally and we, our team, we don't agree with the phrase that Ukraine has to postpone negotiations in this field. We think that it's a wrong opinion. We need to start negotiations in this field as soon as possible. And we know that they will be difficult because otherwise we will never be integrated. Thank you very much for your speech. Um, and the possibility to ask questions. I will do that later on. Now I would like to invite uh, Yulia Klemenko. Uh, she is the first deputy of the head of the um, committee of uh, uh, Verkhovna Rada on transport and infrastructure. Why transport is important for us? Because uh, this is, um, you know, like the system, like the blood system in our body. We won't be able to move without it. So we will be really thankful, Ms. Yulia, on your comment about our study and what is done by the transport committee, because the transport field suffers from the policy that is provided by Poland. Thank you. Greetings, dear colleagues. Thank you very much. I could, for your study, I could not uh, read it till the end, but the conclusions and the numbers that I saw, they are very interesting, and it seems that they uh, require deeper studies, and um, we need to learn what are the reasons and what are the consequences and where we are moving. As for our uh, perspectives and our prospects, I will um, just make a reflection from my colleagues and my own opinion, if we won't find the win-win option, uh, for Euro integration or integration to the EU, it will be really difficult for us to promote our interests. No matter what and how we say, uh, there will be always Polish farmers who want to sell their products and to uh, just uh, upload that first of all in the Polish ports of not after Ukrainians, even if Ukrainians are paying more. And also they are telling that uh, Ukrainians, are, Ukrainians are driving their roads and they did not give money into the funds that were building, uh, constructing the roads. And they will still have some arguments that will impact the business and uh, policy is impacting business proportionally, I would like to say. Uh, therefore, together with the Polish colleagues, uh, and uh, let us uh, say that uh, uh, they now they have 3.5 million Ukrainians, and before they had nine. So if Poland um, would not have opened the borders, and they just let people go to Poland, those who wanted to leave Ukraine, and they also allowed us to export in 2022 a huge number of commodities via their um, roads, and they provided um, their infrastructure. So without that, it would have been really difficult for us. And in this direction, we need to understand that the whole humanitarian direction is going via Poland, and Poland is really active, so to say, they are actively supporting us in all our directions of moving to NATO and um, EU accession. So we have to understand and to take that into account. And it is also coming out of uh, the limitation of transport infrastructure corridors, European corridors, because Europe is uh, not ready for 60 million tons of Ukrainian grain. We are one of the biggest agrarian producers in the region, so for sure we are a serious competitor in products and logistics for local producers, for European producers. We have to accept that, and uh, we have to start promoting our interests, uh, also taking into account this fact. And a lot of European infrastructure are not ready for uh, such amount of Ukrainian export, and they won't be able. So the question is, how can we increase our investments? And I can say that I'm communicating with my uh, colleagues uh, from the parliament, and they are saying, everything is wonderful. Now we are investing in the, uh, the warehouses and ports infrastructure. That's a huge amount of money that have to be taken from the EU budget. It's not uh, simple, and those are huge terminals. And um, like to work with the channels and so on. And they say, okay, what will happen in a year when you win the war? All our infrastructure will uh, 
won't have enough like loads because these capacities they won't be necessary because marine logistics is always the cheapest for agriculture uh, for any commodities marine logistics is uh, always the cheapest and all the fighting that are happening right now in the world are for marine logistics so also they are worried about their expansion of uh, capacities for ukraine because they think that it's a temporary thing and as soon as uh, we return our control over our ports for export we will stop using their infrastructure and it won't be used to full capacity so we won't be able to provide um, some commodities for the european infrastructure so it's a challenge and we have to find some way out and we have to find some kind of win-win option with the europeans how we can resolve the situation as for certain directions i fully agree that now we need to be integrated we won't have a second chance of uh, integration and transfer infrastructure in agrarian sector and all other things as soon as the war ends in one or two years they will start telling us that you just wait a bit over here and it's happening always like that because they will always take care of the interests of their countries and not ukrainian interests second thing is that we also have to understand that we need to have a clear plan of rebuilding related to your integration written in detail so that Europeans understand actually what we plan. Because at present we don't have such a plan and they have certain tension because of that, because in general, like we are we want to rebuild something, but what exactly they don't understand. So when rebuilding certain infrastructure elements we will become competitors to them. So they want to understand what we are going to do in the aviation industry and in ports uh, field, also in transport infrastructure. So now we are working on legislation. We have one big law on Ukrzaliznica, which is going on, and it provision for that the railway will be divided into four companies. Uh, these are uh, cargo, uh, passenger transportation, infrastructure, and uh, service. Taking into account uh, war experience, and many politicians and experts are saying that it's a good concept, but it won't be able to survive under stress conditions. So now we are uh, reviewing all the all the options, and we are reviewing the draft law on railway. And these are also our obligations under the association agreement. As for the road transportation, I think uh, the further we go, the more difficult it will be to continue that. Because again, we are competitors, serious competitors for Polish people. They always used our transport and our drivers as theirs in order to develop their sector. And uh, therefore, they are trying with a number of uh, approvals and uh, the agreement. They try to limit not only Polish people, but also Europeans. They are trying to limit our opportunities of entering European market because our services will be cheaper and maybe even more efficient. Therefore, we have to continue that and we have to understand that we have to find some kind of formula that will allow us uh, to make it interesting for Polish people and for Europeans. As for railway transport, uh, you know that uh, we have the other uh, colleagues and uh, there is a project and um, there are negotiations about the so-called uh, European um, railroads so that it's the same uh, as uh, the European one, and we won't have to stop on the borders and redo the width uh, of uh, uh, the railway track, and this will uh, speed up the process. Those who are taking the train of uh, like um, Ukraine, Kyiv, and Warsaw, you know that um, the train stops for a long time on the border in order to change uh, the uh, track. And uh, then, um, again, as uh, for uh, 
the other topic which will unlikely help with the uh, metallurgy sector or uh, for example other the aviation sector. Uh, we know that it's one of the most integrated into international legislation because in many parts it is covered by international conventions, inter international legislation, and we actually did our um, what was needed, uh, but we will have to rebuild a lot of airports and Europe Commission is speaking about like how many ports do you need airports? Um, maybe you don't need that much um, and so on. So we are holding the discussions, but we understand that aviation transport will start working a few months, maybe even half a year after ending all the military actions. But before that, we won't get permission uh, for flights. Uh, so we have uh, to hope for our armed forces who are growing their capacities in order to clean up the corridors because the grain agreement is working badly already right now and it will become more and more difficult to work uh, with that. And we have to expand our paths to Europe in order to do the transportations, but we have to do that in parallel with the integration and the association agreement. Those ha don't have to be parallel processes, but these are the processes that help each other. And then we will be able to get the funds and approval from the EU side, and it will be a benefit for everyone. So these are actually the updates that we have, and of course we have things to work on. We need to work more intensely on coordination between the reconstruction projects and Euro integration projects, so that those are not two separate blocks where everyone is uh, protecting him or herself. And at present, I see that this is what is happening, and the Euro integration projects don't always go in line uh, with others. Thank you very much, Ms. Yulia, for uh, your speech. I fully agree with your ideas and our only joint reflection about the fear of Europeans to build the joint infrastructure. Still, we think that it has to be done as far as we are neighbors still. And earlier or later, we will become members of the EU and the trade with us will increase. So even in spite of this, Marine. No, I'm not talking about joint infrastructure. They are ready to do this. They don't want to grow the capacity of their own infrastructure. So, like to reorient 60 million tons of grain from our ports to the ports of Constanza and other ports, for example. They understand that this issue can be temporary. At certain period of time, when Ukraine wins, Ukraine will come back to own marine capacities and the uh, marine capacities won't be uploaded to full capacity. As for the joint um, infrastructure, I see no problems with that. But to invest uh, the European money to increasing their port capacity, they don't really want to do that, understanding that Ukrainian clients can come back to Ukrainian ports after the victory. So then uh, we are on the same way. Uh, it's good that we can find uh, the common language with them. Uh, so I would like to invite one more speaker, uh, Lilian Malion. Uh, she is a member of the National Commission for State Regulation of Electronic Communications, uh, Radio Fre Frequency Spectra, and Postal Services. In the previous sessions, it was already mentioned that here Ukraine is doing a lot of uh, work, but this field also suffered a lot, not less than agrarian field. Ms. Lilia, we would like to hear your brief feedback. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Luba. Colleagues, greetings to everyone. I would like to join my colleagues and say that thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for your study and in general for the work that you are doing. It's also very important for us to hear the public sector opinion in order to understand actually the reflections also to our work. I would like to mention that actually um, we have our 2022 started on a very positive note because um, at that uh, moment we had the new sectoral legislation on digital communication on regulator and it uh, was the first story when Ukraine implemented uh, the new European legislation at the same time with the 
states, members of the EU, and uh, people know that a huge set of directives that existed in the EU was substituted with the Code of Digital Communications. And based on this document, we developed and adopted the law on digital communications and on regulator. And with this thing, we did a sufficient progress in performing our obligations under the association agreement and actually a big step towards integration into uh, the joint digital market. But actually, this positive note uh, for the whole country, for just like for all the sectors, it ended on the 24th of February 2022, uh, as soon as the uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine started. And unfortunately, the sector of digital communications and the infrastructure during the, 20, the year of 2022 uh, suffered a lot of losses, and it was very often an object of uh, shall for shellings and um, it was ruined to a great extent because we faced the fact that uh, civil infrastructure, the main role of which is to support connection between people, was used actually by our enemy in order to deprive us of the connection and of the opportunity to have access to information. And the whole year of 2022, we as a regulator, together with our colleagues uh, and together with the market, uh, our key task was to preserve the communication for Ukrainians and do everything possible in order for Ukrainians to have the opportunity to call their relatives and to hear their voices. We did that uh, not only in Ukraine, but also abroad. And Mr. Taras Kachka partially mentioned already the field of roaming and this is probably uh, the subject to our pride, because together with the European operators, we managed really fast to regulate and to work on the mechanism that helped 4.4 million uh, Ukrainians to stay in touch who were forced to be on the territory of the EU. And this gave us a huge step forward in order to talk that the uh, field of roaming is going to be the first one in the EU. So we already ended the amending uh, the association agreement in this field, and we are doing our homework, so to say, on implementing relevant acts of aquas. And next year, we are going to talk seriously about um, Ukraine joining the roaming zone of the EU. So now I can just confirm your phrase that our field suffered a lot um, because of the destruction and challenge. And we have assessment of the World Bank and our own, own assessments we were also calculating. But I would like uh, to say that the field of uh, digital communication is really dynamic and the uh, connection is uh, what is needed every day. We had blackouts, we had problems with the heating in our homes. People were ready to stand with that, but we could not refuse having the connection because the first thing we do is we are going to different social networks or we are calling our relatives. So our operators, they don't wear, wait till the end of the war and the networks uh, that suffered, uh, they uh, were repaired very often under shellings and people were risking their lives. And unfortunately, in our sector, we have human losses. Uh, during actually repair of these networks and operators are still investing and they are updating the infrastructure. Even now, we are not waiting for the war to end. It's a very dynamic process. And of course, it's impossible to comment what is happening on temporarily occupied territories because having experience when our operators were coming to the territories that were deoccupied, uh, the infrastructure was ruined almost to the zero very often. And therefore, it's going to be a certain challenge to for uh, this infrastructure to start working in there. But that is what is done right now. And actually, we are repairing our resources. We are looking for new opportunities and also among European partners all the possible donations um, uh, 
For example, we see that as some equipment or maybe financial aid for this sector to be rebuilt. What I would also like to comment on, in spite of uh, the fact that our task number one was to ensure the connection to Ukrainians, we were actively moving in the framework of the association agreement to the joint digital market of the EU. And I can proudly say that only during the last year, in spite of all the conditions that we were in, we managed to adopt 24 normative legislative acts on digital communications with the regulator. Yes, we have a lot of work to do this year, but our tempos are pretty fast because our field is really dynamic and for sure we are not negotiating about some postponing or so on. Therefore, we are moving really fast and we uh, managed to do five points in the framework of the association agreement and also in your study you mentioned the spectral policy and harmonization of using the spectrum with the EU. I would like to mention that according to our obligations, we have 38 implementation acts in the framework of spectral policy and 26 out of them are fully implemented, seven implemented partially, and the remaining part, of course, is uh, the issue that is going to be considered afterward because using um, spectrum is a really sensitive topic. I would like also to comment on the painful topic, and a lot of people are not um, thinking of this. This is implementing 5G network. It will be a very important step for Ukraine that we will do. But of course, um, after the war and during the war, we have to pay more accent to rebuild the networks that we lost. And only the next step will be the issue of 5G. But it's not uh, the cure, so to say. Yes, Europe is moving fastly to 5G networks, but even there, there are certain details. And many countries, uh, they are developing 5G at the cost of different foundations and not with their own budget. So I think that for Ukraine, it has to become one of the points of dialogue with the EU access to different programs, because in the European Union, the so-called resilience plan there is, uh, from which different countries and uh, they are receiving like for different projects uh, first of all projects for like broadband projects they are receiving money in order to do that in their countries uh, so for uh, Ukraine I think that potentially it could have become a good chance a few more moments because as uh, for the EU directives, in the EU it is uh, known as a post-reduction directive, uh, which is reducing costs uh, for uh, the networks. And um, it's our obligation to implement that, but uh, it's a directive um, under discussion. People try not to talk about that, but the truth is that it uh, did not work well in the EU and the last last two years it's not applied in practice and uh, there is a 5G toolbox so-called which came instead of that and now the EU is discussing the so-called Gigabit Act, Act about Gigabit Infrastructure which is expected to uh, be adopted maybe even this autumn. And here we have to have understanding of the policy about the uh, broadband development and Ukraine is under the conditions of war. Unfortunately, Ukraine gained unique experience how to ensure sustainability of networks and it's a huge added value of ours for European Union. And believe me, now there is huge interest to sustainability of networks in Ukraine. This is something we can come to European union with. This is the case when they are starting from us. I see, Ms. Luba, that I have to end already. So briefly from my side, indeed, I am honored to represent the sector which is moving rapidly and I'm confident that we will become one of the pilot sectors that will have um, the regime of internal market first for roaming and then for the whole sector. And actually here for us, uh, we don't have any problems with our neighbors. It's more about the satisfaction of the consumer's needs because Ukraine is a big country 
and um, people will would like to to enjoy the advantages in this field, but I think that um, we can achieve good result in this field. Thank you. Ms. Lilia, thank you very much for such an optimistic speech. And I really liked your phrase that we uh, received a good experience um, in sustainability of networks and now we can teach Europeans. I think that our negotiations with European side will be very interesting because I remember our discussions with you when it's unclear how the European Union will react and whether their system uh, would have uh, been sustainable if they would have lived through this part. If you have any questions, so please present yourselves and do ask. My question is related to the first speaker. I don't know what your name is, unfortunately. Alexandra. Alexandra, I just listened to you and I came to a conclusion that everything is in regulation uh, things. That is, we regulate and then we move on. But when I listened to Mr. Kachka, I had a totally different conclusion. So he was talking about regulation of um, our trade relationship. So if we add also what I say to that, the recession did not disappear. Till 2028, the countries, first of all, highly developed countries, first 10 countries will have up to 1.5%. And all those contradictions that you were mentioning, they are the result of the recession. And they won't go nowhere. So the question is, shouldn't we be looking the alternatives for the trading policy. I'm not talking about new markets. I'm not I'm talking about the alternative uh, alternatives with the help of which we can develop our trade further on. So for example agrarian sector we've been talking about the speaker from Verhovna Rada mentioned sixty million tons of grain. Maybe we will just feed the grain and we will just transport meat or we will process the corn. USA also grows a lot more corn, but 90% of it is processed. Ukraine is producing a lot less, but we are transporting 90%. So please feed it to pigs. The pigs, just a minute, I knew that um, the pig gives birth two times a year and grows in six months. And until we regulate the trade policy, taking into account this sector, we can get much more efficient result. There is one more alternative. If we just burn the corn for heating, it is much more efficient than, for example, the coal. And there are studies done in this field, but we forbid doing that. We can't do this. That is, I'm talking about alternatives, principal alternatives that are much more efficient and they give two, three times bigger profit than what we are ori orienting like 60 million, uh, taking into account a huge mass of contradictions that if we are taking it into account the recession in the nearest five years, or like we won't uh, talk about different organizations, they still remain until 2028 for sure. Thank you very much. Then Alexander um, and Taras, Alexander and Taras will react. Well, first of all, I would like to mention uh, that uh, the implementation of EU aquas and some political decisions. Actually, in our studies, we were underlining that Ukraine will face problems related not only with implementation, but also with the fact that we have to develop our infrastructure, we have to rebuild the industry, 
we have uh, to rebuild the quality infrastructure, and we have to work on many things related to some physical things that we will have to rebuild our economy and infrastructure in order to serve the economy. Therefore, actually, we have that in our study, and we've been writing about that not a single time, that this is not the single problem that Ukraine will face. As for the trade policy, I think that Mr. Taras Kachka can tell more about it. But for me, it's obvious that our trade with the EU will grow. And it will happen. Why? Because even the countries who are candidates, who receive the candidates' status, we are in a unique situation because uh, we have the war going on. And it's not to our advantage. So uh, they are trade with the neighboring countries grew in the nearest years. So I expect, actually, that we will get benefits from that um, access to internal market. We will be able to export more. But now we have really like physical limitations. And we will have to look for the new markets. We will have to develop processing and reprocessing. But the issue of EU integration is very strategically important. We are not talking about that. It's absolutely correct. You are talking about infrastructure. Europe, if I am not mistaken, 80% and even more percents of uh, these moments, uh, they are developed in the network of roads. We are doing that via railway transport. And we have to understand whether the roads are like this or like that. It's a really big problem. If we stay in the ideology you are talking about, then we are involved into serious contradictions of uh, uh, global money flow in order to do that. Do you understand what I'm talking about? If we reduce the number of tones, then the logics logics become simpler. We are talking not about two, three years, about 15, 20 years when the new structure of economy and new money flows will be created. What you are saying is totally correct, and we do not deny that. There are other things that make us do this European integration, but uh, the chaussée has to be changed. It doesn't have to be the key one in comparison with others. That is, in parallel, we have to develop other processes. I think that the main problem here is uh, using the word alternative, because it's not the issue of alternatives, because alternative is a choice, or, or, you know, one or the other one. Well, first of all, you are going into the discussion of more global uh, economic development. First of all, I will say, I would like to say that if we are talking from this perspective, then it is totally clear that uh, development of the economy is our task, and European Union won't think uh, of us and each member of the EU as of today, even from the point of view of finances, the biggest uh, one is a post-COVID renovation of the money that are given via European Union to uh, member states for economic development. But the priorities are determined by different countries like Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, and so on, Spain, Germany. All of them, they are getting the money and they are thinking of their priorities. So I think that it's a... Uh, you know, um, mistaken feeling that regulatory decisions are the drivers of the economy. No. The issue is, these are not my words. That is what I understood from, I, and I understood from her speech. Uh, I think we are talking about the perception, because when we are talking about um, the integration with the European Union, uh, the um, biggest amount is switching to the tools of forming the policy that are there in the EU. But these rules don't live on themselves. They are evolutioning, they are changing, and it's not always successful in the EU itself. But uh, this is the main task still of our integration, because one does not 
substitute the other one we have a wonderful example which um, actually can work well with your logics this is reprocessing and uh, reprocessing of agrarian products and how we can be efficient that is um, breeding and also like meat field um, and also well I'm not agreeing uh, with you because if uh, uh, we are talking if we are talking about your logics and beef and chicken is much better for your logics but what the story is about it's it says that we could grow export of animal products meaning according to statistics we can see today that in addition to chicken um, beef and so on like i mean the beef has a world tendency that the trade is switching to uh, the trade with like live animals because like Spain, uh, Spanish uh, people and we, we are just departing the animals live. But as for uh, the live animals and as for uh, the meat, frozen meat, we have good in dynamics, not millions of tons, but good dynamics. The same with milk, dry milk, yeah, and the same. I can just discuss a lot of that because if we are talking about the whole livestock, efficient and not, we it goes down. If we are talking about efficient and we are talking about efficient productions, it was growing at least before the war, but it's a separate discussion. So what is the most important thing here is that live in reading is when we are exporting and we can do that only when we are accepted there only when we are integrated it also depends on our being efficient and also the people who uh, received money they could invest and they used money of uh, some international institutions not state banks we need to consider that in complex but the fact that implementation of European rules helps us promote our products this is the axiom that I'm ready to defend and the fields that refused to have integration with the EU first of all that is aviation which was really stubborn in telling us that for this like we don't need eu we will go to northern korea and so on and so forth so this is the example of anti like when people bright people with technologies but they were stubbornly against some international standards they just ruined their field i'm sorry we have a second channel i'm sorry colleagues we have lack of time for the second presentation we can discuss that by years thank you yeah the subject of our study is how to use all these rules and norms in order for our country to function right now we fully support all your phrases but unfortunately we are limited in time and the subject of the further studies i would like to invite my colleague Dmitry uh, naomenko to present our next study in spite of difficult relationship with neighbors and what Teres mentioned that the association agreement is already the issue like the trust is um, already not that strong but we continue monitoring that and watching its performance because we think that it's the basics that will give us the possibility to go into negotiations with the EU so Dmitry uh, the floor is yours Thank you very much, Luba. Greetings to everyone. Actually, I will ask to show the presentation on the screen. So this study actually is our like regular and traditional, and we are doing that um, from the middle of 2016. Uh, we had certain stages of development. Our main task is to show, right, just a second. Okay, we have some problems, technical, of technical nature. But 
uh, before we've been discussing sectoral situation and this study shows us the average temperature you know and namely how do we implement the association, association agreement and our obligations under the agreement if we are talking about the percentage of performing that we are having a long and good friendship with the office who is also making this official monitoring and they have the resources of theirs we have our own online resource navigator and correspondingly we show our assessment and they show theirs and if we start talking from our assessments then here i i made three pay charts that are showing certain dynamics from the moment of our last adopted methodology so we can compare how on uh, the agreement implementation was progressing in our three monitoring periods here it's very important to mention how to read these uh, pie charts correctly we are operating two kinds of progress general and this uh, general progress you can see inside uh, these circles this is uh, the uh, number which uh, is uh, sticking to the number shown by the uh, government office uh, on euro integration and we can see that in the first half of 2020 it was uh, 42 percent first half of uh, uh, 21 it's 49 percent at the end of 2022 our last assessment we consider that the general progress in performing the agreement is uh, 55 percent so the governmental number you remember so we were uh, reporting approximately like 70 plus percent for performing the agreement and on this stage it is important to understand what we are including to the progress notion and here it's important to uh, highlight the understanding of uh, good progress or like perfect progress that shows the obligations that we performed from the point of, uh, of view of um, bringing that process to some logical end so either or we had the block of sectoral legislation or for example we implemented that in practice we created new institutions and new norms that really work and they promote our sectoral integration so as you can see this perfect progress at the end of 2022 we consider it's not us actually but it's our our expert team who's been working on this we had our team um consisting of 30 approximately 30 independent experts and we think that agreement is uh, fulfilled for like one third all other stages that are included to um, the general progress these are the stages either like intermediate or because you can see the gray yellow zones we call them early progress uh, or just advanced progress those are the things that uh, have been done on certain stages but uh, they did not come to their logical ending yet and what is more important is the gray zone where it haven't started and we can see good news from uh, the graphs that the gray zone reduced uh, at least uh, from uh, the middle of 2020 but if we compare the first half of 21 and end of 2022 we also can see that the situation more or less remains this remains static and our progress was like six percent and uh, this other type of progress also was growing but not much and i would like to mention how can we compare our assessment and assessment from the government office and here we have deep fundamental actually difference and it is um in having different horizons for assessment i don't want to reduce um, the importance of 
uh, work uh, our colleagues in the office and other ministries because they are doing this uneasy work. But if we are talking about government monitoring system, it is built, first of all, on government plans. And their path to our like finish to full implementation of assessment, it's a bit briefer than we are assessing when we are looking at that from our non-governmental point of view. We can see that, by the way, also with the uh, communications of uh, these assessments of the government is communicating and they say like, yeah, we adopted this wonderful law, but what is happening later on with this law? Nobody knows, actually. And uh, this is not shown in the communication and very often nothing's happening there. And I won't speak about all these sectors. We can see that um, on the third of uh, agreement, we we did our work for 100%. And you see the difference of roads uh, gives us correspondingly different assessments. And like they had 70% of uh, that, and we think that we did only a bit more than a half. And these pictures that also have certain symbolism, you know, certain symbolic meaning, how we uh, perceive this uh, euro integration and where we are there. So our path is uh, more difficult. Uh, it's a um, long way still to go. And we have this kind of like red line when we have some some reduction in what was done already. Like if the government is making the new plan, for example, then this but like we don't care we still see where we need to go and at the end to this slide i would like to mention that probably that um our assessment will be the last one like according to the last year both the government and we had it similarly and again we expect the negotiations on accession and there will be a um, huge number of aquas and we will have like sectoral division and chapters 35 parts of negotiation process and there will be other approaches to monitoring and as far as we know the government is now working on the update of their system therefore we truly hope that our their um next work in monitoring we will do much better and um, if we briefly go through the sectoral progress that we saw, so we were arranging the sectors on the notion of this perfect progress. You can see this green zone and uh, the light green sector, all the intermediate, intermediate stages, and then also obligations in which we did not start performing these are in gray and we see state procurement we see technical regulation we see external policy safety policy energy sector they were most so to say they showed the best cumulative progress i will not mention all of that you can see that in the report and i will skip the next slide because you see here such sectors which are demonstrating now uh, the least cumulative progress. I will just stop on the highlighting effect of 2022. Here we show the sectors that were growing in their progress from more than 10%. And the situation is not typical, actually, because traditionally we had such pioneer sectors as state procurement, technical barriers, for trade and so on. And here our progress was in statistics and cooperation in um, fighting with uh, fraud and so on and so forth in the sectors that used to be outsiders. But the situation of 2022 was really atypical from this point of view. And uh, we received the negative impact of war, which emerged. I will start here with the second point that the changes 
uh, that started in those like unpopular sectors and we we noticed those it was this like candidates um so we had candidate criteria and from june last year we are seeing a certain boom you know not only in the exotics exotic thing as statistics but also in a range of reforms in a range of the framework legislation or adoption the laws on human rights the framework law on uh, minorities and so on and so forth and uh, this part will give us some more activities some more work that we will be able to see probably this year already but the war caused actually negative impact that is the second half of 2021 we saw that there is a there is certain slowing down in performing our um association uh agreement obligations but the war unfortunately just in the first half of uh, 2022 almost stopped the process reasons are obvious the state resources were redirected to totally different needs uh, there was a problem with the staff and there was certain centralization of uh, power under military conditions at the end i would like to mention that the agreement remains the only sectoral integration document and now we continue working in accordance with that till the moment uh, when we understand the framework and we will see that when negotiating and what my colleagues already mentioned i would not repeat them but uh, the key conclusion is that we need to understand first of all in order to set the tasks how we can integrate because there are certain sectors that can show good results already now and with other sectors we will have to set a task with the transition periods and with postponing certain works because uh, modernization of energy sector or creating um, the system for reducing emissions and so on this is difficult from the point of view of involving money and uh, most of those reforms will happen in uh, post-military rebuilding thank you very much for your attention thank you very much for uh, such speed Dmitro. i'm sorry that the first panel lasted so long and correspondingly our next speakers i will ask to speak for maximum seven minutes i would like to invite mr albert fernandez uh, diaz who is uh, head of um the uh represent who is representative of the eu in ukraine we would like to hear uh, from the european side about that because we are monitoring the process but in general what is the vision of the eu are you going to monitor that or you're going to monitor the, some requirements to candidates what is your vision in this part thank you um hello i can hear my voice uh, can you hear me now Yes, yep. we can hear you. Okay, hello, good, good morning, um, and uh, thanks to Dimitro for the succinct and very quick uh, summary you made of the report that I, I also read. Um, maybe a couple of, of comments since we don't have a lot of time. <clears throat> I, first of all, thanks for organizing such events. I think it's good that the society at large gets um, acquainted with what it means to go through this process of accession to the EU. This is a process that many countries have gone through, including my own country, Spain, at the time. And uh, this had a transformative effect for the society. So it's good that all the um, elements in the civil society and the business and the authorities uh, get on board and are working together towards this endeavor of uh, joining the EU. Uh, what I would like to emphasize, and I agree with Dimitro in the in the assessment that for the time being we have a very good uh, roadmap <clears throat> on the table, and that is the association agreement. The association agreement between the EU and Ukraine is one of the most advanced that we have in terms of um, not only regulatory approximation, but also possibilities for market access. So this agreement that has been enforced already um, for several years now is the fact of the legal basis that is allowing Ukraine to integrate more and more into the EU. Uh, and I'm talking here notably about the internal market, 
This is one of the objectives of the association agreement. So this is something that the Balkans did not have. So it's an advantage for Ukraine as well. So that means that you can already start to reap the benefits of uh, having access to the EU internal market and activate several of the provisions there, which allow Ukraine to benefit uh, as any other member states of the same treatment um, in, uh, as regards access to the internal market. This is the first thing. Now, about the accession process itself, um, it's more of a political process. Um, it, it is strongly based on regulatory approximation, but not only. Uh, also, the quality of the institutions, the enforcement, um, and the setup of the institutional framework that is responsible for this enforcement is, plays a big role. And in that sense, the EU has been discussing with Ukraine through different sectoral meetings and structures how to improve this. This will be the first year that the EU is including Ukraine in the annual enlargement package. The enlargement package is a report that is issued normally in October that provides an overview of where Ukraine stands on the different chapters of accession. You know that this has been revised. Now we have clusters. We have, for instance, one cluster that is called internal market. So we have already worked on the first draft, the first version of this cluster. And I would like also to thank the Ukrainian authorities, particularly the Minister of Economy. I see that Taras Kashka was there before for the input that they also provided for this exercise, because this goes two ways. Uh, but it's true that at the end now, um, the European Commission will present a report uh, on where Ukraine stands in the different areas of regulatory approximation. I cannot say now what the final outcome will be, because the European Commission will only provide some um, recommendation or some opinion. But then this will have to be assessed by member states. Uh, you know that the Council of the EU plays a big role in the, when it comes to accession. It was the Council of the EU that decided that Ukraine should become a candidate country. And it is also uh, the Council of the EU that will decide if we eventually open negotiations. So this is a very political process. Uh, but uh, we think that with the strength of the association agreement, um, with the commitment of Ukraine that we are seeing, and with continued efforts, if we sustain this work, if we sustain this uh, enthusiasm, then we could get there faster, rather sooner than later. Uh, and finally, uh, just to mention about, it's a bit linked with the previous session, but uh, about the internal market. We're also already, as I said, working to make sure that Ukraine can uh, get integrated into the EU internal market. There are several um, aspects of the agreement that we can use. We have a legal basis for that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have already an agreement that allows Ukraine to start to be more and more integrated. And we think that this is, um, this is um, a process that is inevitable. Ukraine will become more and more uh, enshrined into the EU internal market by means of integration in supply chains or um, more and more complex trade relations. Uh, there are challenges, of course, with some sectors, agriculture, etc. We're working on that, but we are getting there. So that's all I have to say. Thanks a lot, and I hope I didn't go above my five minutes. Yes, yes, you minute. are Thank completely you. in time, Alberto. I am grateful for you a lot. Uh, now I would like to invite to the floor Ms. Um, Angela Antoniak, who is People's Deputy and member of Rahuna Rada of uh, Ukraine on Ukraine's integration with the EU. So, Ms. Alena, uh, that is my problem. I did not um, watch the time, but five minutes, please, not to uh, delay the other event. Hello, everyone. Do you see me? Yes, we can see you. We can hear you. Thank you very much for the time to make my speech. I will try to be brief as for our work in uh, Verkhovna Rada, as uh, uh, for our uh, committee and integration of uh, to the EU. And after Ukraine received the status of uh, the candidate member on the level of EU, certain steps were made in order to strengthen the work of the E of uh, Ukraine in Euro integration direction. Actually, 29th of uh, uh, July, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine adopted resolution on certain measures uh, uh, related to 
performing obligations of Ukraine in European integration, and it determined the the main task was to adapt the legislation of Ukraine to uh, the EU acquis and also ensure the that uh, the acts of that are legislative acts in Ukraine are in line with European ones. As for the operational level, the resolution provided for creation in each committee of Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine subcommittees on adaptation of Ukrainian legislation to provisions of uh, EU acquis. We can say that for all Euro integration um, draft laws, profile committees have to have the tables of correspondence to of the uh, draft law to the association agreement and also have in their their disposal the official translation of uh, the EU Act. I would like to mention straight away that actually uh, with the official translation we had some issues not a single time because it's not always that such translation is available. And uh, this resolution provides for separate tasks to for our committee on um, Ukrainian integration to the EU. And first of all, they are as follows. During the previous consideration of uh, the draft law, our committee sees uh, the availability or lack of provisions related with the adaptation of the Ukrainian legislation to EU provisions. And we are providing the relevant conclusion to the profiled committee. Uh, secondly, uh, for the before the second reading, we are making analysis of the initiative uh, on whether it is corresponding the legislation whether it's in line with European legislation. And we always, Ms. Elena, I'm sorry, we have one minute physically. They are interrupting us. OK, if physically, I will briefly mention that it is uh, well provisioned for by the resolution of Rada, But unfortunately, as of today, the reality is a bit different because as of today, in the secretariat of our committee, there are seven people working who actually are working 24-7, and uh, still it is not expanded, the secretariat, but we are trying to we are trying to involve other experts. We are trying to constantly work with the uh, European missions that are giving us aid in processing uh, the draft laws, because almost all of them are going through our Euro integration committee, as we call it. And uh, recently, it was confirmed that we had uh, the meeting of the committee on uh, the these uh, points of like uh, when you are crossing the border, and also our specialists are helping us with practice, with legislative practice, and also with how we can interpret that into our legislation in our lives. And the opinion of our committee is that still we have to be expanded. The secretariat has to be expanded as much as possible because all these auxiliary institutions is good, but we have to have this institutional memory and some things that will ensure, actually, will be ensured by our committee, by our profile. I am sorry, uh, we will have to end. I never moderated that harshly, you know, but it's my fault. I know that you are, I understand that you're getting ready right to this process. And um, the biggest difficulty is institutional uh, capacity, which is not strengthened. Yeah, but we are working on that. We are working on strengthening and we need to expand also our secretariat. I think that it will happen in the nearest time. Then we wish you success. I thank you very much for your time. I thank everyone who's been watching us online. I thank everyone who came in person to ask us questions. And I thank very much our uh, donor of F foundation of uh, Conrad Denout, who gives us opportunity to uh, present our studies, to make these studies, and to make our small, at least analytical, uh, input of uh, movement of Ukraine to EU. Thank you very much and have a good day.